Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a star at the very least on my review of Raise High the Roof Beam Carpenters and Seymour, an introduction by JD Salinger. I have a whole bunch of tabs on this. I actually have to do this quickly because I, I need to send it to my um, my friend, um, Andrew, in the US. He said he's read all of the uh, JD Salinger books except for this one, which he's not been able to track down, so I'm going to post it to him. I said I would do that shortly after Christmas. Um, it is now 8th of January, so I need to do it soon. Um, so yes, it doesn't have a blur. So I'm just going to go right in and um, start checking out uh, tabs and then share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. It's basically two short stories, almost novellas, um, by J.D. Salinger, the author of The Catcher in the Rye. It actually follows the family that are mentioned, I believe, in Franny and Zoe. They are mentioned as characters in this. I haven't actually read that yet, so I don't know. Um, my copy actually has a little in thing on the in the front page. Uh, somebody's written, Aid, I quite like this book. What do you think? And I would love to know what Aid thought. Dane reads. So, um, then we have the dedication, and it said, it says, if there is an amateur reader still left in the world, or anybody who just reads and runs, ask him or her, with untellable affection and gratitude, to split the dedication of this book four ways with my wife and children, which I just thought was a fun little dedication. So on to Raise High the Roof Beam Carpenters, and the plot of this is basically our narrator has gone to his brother's wedding, uh, that's all you need to know for now. His brother doesn't show up, basically. So here we get, you know, the two youngest children in the family, Zoe, male, and Franny, female, were with our parents in Los Angeles, where my father was hustling talent for a motion picture studio. Uh, so that's when I realised, okay, this ties in with those. Um, the ch all the children in their family had also been weekly hired guests on a show called It's a Wise Child, which was a radio show, and that comes into play here and there. I actually want to read this out so you can tell a little bit more about it. Uh, Seymour, so obviously Seymour, and an introduction. Seymour is the older brother we're talking about here. Seymour and I were the first to appear on the show back in 1927 at the respective ages of 10 and 8, in the days where the programme emanated from one of the convention rooms of the old Murray Hill Hotel. All seven of us, from Seymour through Franny, appeared on the show under pseudonyms, which may sound highly anomalous considering that we're the children of vaudevillians, a sect not usually antipathetic to publicity, but my mother had once read a magazine article on the little crosses professional children are obliged to bear, their estrangement from normal, presumably desirable society, and she took an iron stand on the issue and never, never wavered. This is not the time at all to go into the question of what, whether most or all professional children ought to be outlawed, pitied, or unsentimentally executed as disturbers of the peace. For a moment, I'll only pass along that our combined income on It's a Wise Child has sent six of us through college and is now sending the seventh. So yeah, they go to the wedding, the groom doesn't show up, and a bunch of them sort of get into cars to go to, I guess, what would be the reception to pick up the pieces. Um, and yeah, he end, our narrator ends up getting into a car and he, uh, he hits his head. Um, he says, In doing it, I hit my head a very audible, perhaps retributive, crack on the roof. One of the occupants of the car was none other than my whispering acquaintance, Helen Silsburn, and she started to offer me her unqualified sympathy. The crack had evidently resounded throughout the car, but at 23, I was the sort of young man who responds to all public injury of his person, short of a fractured skull, by giving out a hollow, subnormal-sounding laugh. I'm 34, and almost 35, and I still do that. And basically, the occupants of the car learn that um, he is the brother of the bridegroom who didn't show up. And uh, they also know that they were on this radio show, so we get some kind of conversations around that, which I thought was interesting. We get a bunch of these kind of conversations in the car, and then they end up at Seymour's New York apartment. Um, and we get... The Matron of Honor spoke up from the other side of the room, from the invisible dusty recesses of the couch. I'd like to see a kid of mine get on one of those crazy programs, she said, or act. Any of those things. I'd die, in fact, before I'd let any child of mine turn themselves into a little exhibitionist before the public. It warps their whole entire lives. The publicity and all, if nothing else. Ask any psychiatrist. I mean, how can you have any kind of normal childhood or anything? A head crowned in a now lopsided circlet of flowers suddenly popped into view. As though disembodied, it perched on the catwalk of the back of the couch, facing the lieutenant and me. That's probably what's the matter with that brother of yours. I mean, you lead an absolutely freakish life like that when you're a kid, and so naturally you never learn to grow up. You never learn to relate to normal people or anything. That's exactly what Mrs. Fedder was saying in that crazy bedroom a couple of hours ago. But exactly, your brother's never learned to relate to anybody. All he can do, apparently, is go around giving people a bunch of stitches in their faces. He's absolutely unfit for marriage, or anything halfway normal, for goodness' sake. As a matter of fact, that's exactly what Mrs. Fedder said. The head then turned just enough to glare over at the lieutenant. Am I right, Bob? Did she or didn't she say that? Tell the truth. 
The next voice to speak up was not the lieutenant's, but mine. My mouth was dry and my groin felt damp. Don't know why. I said I didn't give a good goddamn what Mrs. Fedder had to say on the subject of Seymour, or for that matter, what any professional dilettante or amateur bitch had to say. I said that from the time Seymour was ten years old, every summer come loud a thinker and intellectual men's room attendant in the country had been having a go at him. I said it might be different if Seymour had just been some nasty little high IQ show off. I said he hadn't ever been an exhibitionist. He went down to the broadcast every Wednesday night as though he were going to his own funeral. He didn't even talk to you, for God's sake, the whole way down on the bus or subway. I said that not one goddamn person of all the patronising fourth-rate critics and column writers had ever seen him for what he really was. A poet, for God's sake. And I mean a poet. If he never wrote a line of poetry, he could still flash what he had at you with the back of his ear if he wanted to. There's a mention here of R.H. Blythe's definition of sentimentality, uh, that we're being sentimental when we give to a thing more tenderness than God gives to it. So there is a dead cat incident, which I think is quite interesting. Don't worry, um, animal lovers. I'm also an animal lover. You don't have to worry about it. Um, Mrs. Fedder has been haunted for days by my remark at dinner one night that I'd like to be a dead cat. She asked me at dinner last week what I intended to do after I got out of the army. Did I intend to resume teaching at the same college? Would I go back to teaching at all? Would I consider going back on the radio, possibly as a commentator of some kind? I answered that it seemed to me that the war might go on forever and that I was only certain that if peace ever came again I would like to be a dead cat. Mrs. Fedder thought I was cracking a joke of some kind, a sophisticated joke. She thinks I'm very sophisticated according to Muriel. She thought my deadly serious comment was the sort of joke one ought to acknowledge with a light musical laugh. When she laughed I suppose it distracted me a little and I forgot to explain to her. I told Muriel tonight that in Zen Buddhism a master was once asked what was the most valuable thing in the world and the master answered that a dead cat was because no one could put a price on it. Great little quote here, I'm a kind of paranoiac in reverse, I suspect people of plotting to make me happy. Talks about when there's a bad connection on the phone, uh, uh, the connection was bad and I couldn't talk at all during most of the call. How terrible it is when you say I love you and the person at the other end shouts back, what? Alrighty, so now we're going to move on to Seymour, an introduction. Um, I did really enjoy Raise High the Brute Roof Beam Carpenters, that story in of itself was probably a 4 out of 5. Seymour, an introduction I liked a little bit less, it is tough to read, I mean you can see here, that's all part of the same paragraph, those two pages. So um, Seymour, Seymour Glass is his full name. Uh, we learn at the age of 31 while vacationing down in Florida with his wife, he committed suicide. And he says, the true artist seer, the heavenly fool who can and does produce beauty, is mainly dazzled to death by his own scruples, the blinding shapes and colors of his own scared human conscience. And we learn a bit more about the family. He says, uh, still, we were a family of seven children originally. And as it happened, none of us was in the least tongue-tied. It's an exceedingly weighty matter when six naturally profuse verbalizers and expounders have an undefeatable champion talker in the house. True, he never sought the title. And he passionately yearned to see one or another of us outpoint or simply outlast him in a conversation or an argument. A small matter which, of course, though he himself never saw it, he had his blank spots like everybody else. Bothered some of us all the more. The fact remains that the title was always his, and Though I think he would have given almost anything on earth to retire it, this is the weightiest matter of all surely, and I'm not going to be able to explore it deeply for another few years. He never did find a completely graceful way of doing it. Alright, uh, we have a hell of a, a sentence here, but I do think this is quite interesting and it tells you a bit more about Seymour. Since early in 1948, I've been sitting, my family thinks literally, on a loose leaf notebook inhabited by 184 short poems that my brother wrote during the last three years of his life, both in and out of the army, but mostly in, well in. I intend very soon now, it's just a matter of days or weeks, I tell myself, to stand aside from about 150 of the poems and let the first willing publisher who owns a pressed morning suit and a fairly clean pair of grey gloves bear them away, right off to his shady presses, where they'll very likely be constrained in a two-toned dust jacket, complete with a back flap featuring a few few curiously damning remarks of endorsement, as solicited and acquired from those name poets and writers who have no compunction about commenting in public on their fellow artists' works, customarily reserving their more deeply quarter-hearted commendations for their friends, suspected inferiors, foreigners, fly-by-night oddities, and toilers in another field. Then on to the Sunday literary sections where, if there's room, if the critique of the big new definitive biography of Grover Cleveland doesn't run too long, they'll be tersely introduced to the poetry-loving public by one of the little band of regulars, moderate salary pedants and income supplementers who can be trusted to review new books of poetry not necessarily either wisely or passionately but tersely and I think that says a lot about Salinger's own view of you know literary criticism and our narrator says I live alone but catless I'd like everybody to know I live alone but with two cats I am living the happier life mate uh, great little line here as well about the poet 
You can't argue with someone who believes or just passionately suspects that the poet's function is not to write what he must write, but rather to write what he would write if his life depended on his taking responsibility for writing what he must in a style designed to shut out as few of his old librarians as humanly possible. He says that Seymour's poems, uh, each of his poems is as unsonorous or as quiet as he believed a poem should be, but there are intermittent short blasts of euphony, for want of a less atrocious word for it, which have the effect on me, personally, of someone, surely no one completely sober, opening my door, blowing three or four or five unquestionably sweet and expert notes on a corner into the room, then disappearing. Uh, and I, I think that should be what poetry, that's the role of poetry, you know? And talking of his uh, brother's poems, he says, By far the majority of the 184 poems are immeasurably not light, but high-hearted, and can be read by anyone, anywhere, even aloud in rather progressive orphanages on stormy nights. But I wouldn't unreservedly recommend the last 30 or 35 poems to any living soul who hasn't died at least twice in his lifetime, preferably slowly. I love this. He says, uh, Seymour once said on the air when he was 11 that the thing he loved the most in the Bible was the word watch. The narrator says, Buddy Glass, of course, is only my pen name. My real name is Major George Fielding Anticlimax. We get a reference to Seymour's height. He's 5'10 and a half, a short, tall man by modern multiple vitamin standards. Um, and yes, I'm 5'9, well, 5'9 and a half, so a little shorter than him. Um, I'm slightly below the average height for a male, uh, but my girlfriend thinks I'm tall for some reason, but it's because she's a short ass. Uh, so we get another bit. Some more stuff about Seymour. Um, he bounded up all flights of stairs. He rushed them. I rarely saw him take a flight of stairs any other way, uh, which is what I do as well. I don't know why. Except for my, my stairs here, because it's a spiral staircase, so I can't get a good run on them. And also, if I fall, I will die. And another thing that I thought was interesting, only too often, sadly, a good poet turns into a damn poor keeper of his body. But I believe he is usually issued a highly serviceable one to start out with. Um, and... It's true, and I was kind of like that as a creative as well. I was like, it doesn't matter about being fit and all of that. Like, it's all about my brain. Um, and recently, I have got into personal fitness. I'm actually wearing my gym t-shirt, or one of my gym t-shirts. I have three of these just red t-shirts that are breathable for when I run on the treadmill. A bit sore. And we get this little bit. Uh, there used to be an exceptionally intelligent and likeable boy on the radio with S and me, one Curtis Caulfield, who was eventually killed during one of the landings in the Pacific. Um, and obviously, uh, Holden Caulfield. It's been a while since I've read The Catcher in the Rye though, so I can't tell you exactly how that ties in. I assume it's his brother, but I can't remember whether it's mentioned in The Catcher in the Rye that his brother's dead. Anyway, Raise High the Roof Beam Carpenters and Seymour, an introduction by J.D. Salinger. I enjoyed Raise High the Roof Beam Carpenters more. Seymour, an introduction was fascinating in terms of it being a character study. Um, and I do love a good character study. Uh, it's one of those where there's like there's not really any plot. It's just him talking about Seymour. And really, the same is true of Raise High the Roof Beam Carpenters. It's very much a story about Seymour, even though Seymour is absent throughout it. Um, but it is at least a little bit more accessible. It is told more like a story. We, you know, we don't have as many massive paragraphs. Um, you know, more bits of dialogue and some things happening in it. Um, whereas Seymour an introduction, things happen in it, but it's all stuff that's happened in the past, you know. Um, but overall, I probably would have given Raise High the Reef Beam Carpenters a 4 out of 5, Seymour an introduction a strong 3.5 out of 5, and combined I'm going to give it a 4 out of 5. I am now going to send this to my friend Andrew in America. I told him I would send it to him back in December. It is now a month after I said I'd send it to him and I'm finally getting round to it. So there you have it, that's what I made of Raise High the Roof Beam Carpenters and Seymour an Introduction by J.D. Salinger. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video, hit that subscribe button for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot, bye bye.